What's up, everybody? Come on, you could do a little better than that, I feel. Okay? Okay, so uh, welcome again. My name is Joey. I'm the lead pastor right here. We're honored you're with us. Want to welcome our physical locations, everybody online. It's a great day to be in the house of God. Philly's moving on in the playoffs. All right, Eagles, 4-0 so far. Okay, God's good so far. All right, depends how we give. We'll see what happens. <laughs> kidding, just kidding, just kidding, maybe. Uh, <laughs> Anyway, listen, uh, I'm so grateful uh, that, you, that you're, you're, you're here. You're gonna, we're we're going to hear God's word in just a moment, but I've got to do a few housekeeping items, okay? Uh, nobody's in trouble, just a few announcements, all right? But it's important, especially if you're a guest with us. Let me kind of update you with what's happening. We're in a six week, this is week four, six week uh, kind of campaign, public phase called Here to Stay. And it's really a two year campaign, but we'll, we'll, we'll begin to talk about different things, uh, you know, when this ends and uh, in a few weeks. But ultimately, what we're doing, kind of the macro goal, is that we're buying some strategic properties throughout our city. Uh, we've already bought Port Richmond and Espanol's building, we're finishing renovations. <laughs> Okay, uh, and uh, our, our next facility that we're buying, we're in. The, we're currently in some serious negotiations for a property in the Northeast where we broadcast from. And we really need to keep praying. There's a lot that goes into this stuff. Please keep praying. And then we'll finish with uh, attempting to purchase in the Northwest. And so I feel like these are th three strategic properties that we can begin with. It's very important. You can go back and watch our film as to why we're doing this, which is on YouTube. Uh, but, but ultimately, the, the, I guess that's, that's the tangible goal of this. Uh, but the, the intangibles is really, this is a discipleship campaign. What I mean by that is this, is you're going to hear from God. God's going to ask you to do some sacrificial things. You're going to hear. You're going to test your faith. God's going to come through, meet your needs. And uh, he's going to do something in our midst where lots of people are going to come to Christ. Next generation is going to be impacted. We're going to make a difference by purchasing these facilities that are going to impact generations to come. So it's really, really, this is, this is much bigger, much bigger than facilities. This is a discipleship thing. This is a make Jesus famous thing. And so that's why it's going to take everybody to do it. When, when our kids and youth next week are bringing their, their piggy banks and their, uh, their fanny packs, and, and it's, it's about making a difference in those who are to come. So that's really what this is about, okay? Now, Advanced Commitment Night was great. Here's what's next, okay? Next week, kids are bringing their stuff on. On October 23rd, it's a very important day at locations that have kids ministry. Uh, we'll obviously have our Paul Fop pop-up fest, and uh, but we'll have Commitment Sunday. It's where you'll bring your cards or you'll fill out your cards and you'll make a two-year commitment. And don't let that scare you. God's going to help you. All right, and that's why we're preaching these messages. It's a very, 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 very important day. Please be in the house and do not miss church on the 23rd. It's very important, okay? Now, here's how this happens. Uh, here's the, basically here is our uh, commitment chart. Uh, ultimately, uh, it, over the next two years, we're gonna raise a little over $6 million. There are different ways that that happens. Uh, and uh, our, uh, we'll, that will be about 2.8 additional million dollars. And uh, it's gonna take everybody, kids, students, adults, everybody, but we can do it together. Here's how it gets broken up. Uh, here's a giving ladder. Uh, ultimately, uh, for a lot of folks, you're gonna commit to giving for the first time and it's gonna make a massive difference. Okay, the, the next level of that is those who are already giving you're going to become intentional givers. You're going to make it a percentage. Those who've done that but aren't tithing, you're going to step up and become tithers, 10% returners, full biblical obedience. And for those who are already doing that, we're going to become extravagant givers. We're going to give out of stored assets. We're going to give above and beyond. And uh, we're, we're, we are about 30 per, 35, 39% uh, of above and beyond commitment so far. So we've got a lot of, we, we've done that with our leaders. So everybody's going to step up and going to participate on Commitment Sunday to get us to 100%, which is our goal. Everybody participating. Uh, there was a, uh, a middle schooler 
uh, at Advance Commitment Night. And this was for our leaders uh, or anyone who wanted to lead. We had a middle school little girl. Uh, she filled out a commitment card and it was legit and realistic. And she made a commitment and it wasn't a lot of money but it was a sacrifice for her through her allowance and through her little job. And it was powerful because guess what? I believe she's going to do it. She's going to exceed it. And that's the kind of stuff God's looking for. All right. So, all right. So that's kind of what we're doing. We don't always talk about money, uh, but really money is really about the heart. So that's kind of why we're talking about it. We'll talk about joy over the next few weeks as we get into the holiday season, but I really want to help you become all you're meant to be in Christ. And a lot of times that starts with our financial security because Jesus is meant to be our full security. Now, uh, let me help us out. I don't always tell jokes. I just tell stories about my life and my life sometimes is a joke. But let me tell you a real, tell you a re- a real joke. Uh, there, there were two men, two men who crashed, had a plane crash, middle of the ocean. They landed on this island and uh, one of the guys went and searched. They, they survived and the guy goes, hey, brother, to the other guy, there's no fresh water and there's no food. We're doomed. And the one guy says, bro, I'm not worried about it. I make $100,000 a week. Come on, somebody. And, uh, and so he said, great, that's great. What, what is your money gonna do here? There's no food or fresh water. He said, brother, I tithe, give 10% back through my local church every single weekend. He said, well, that's great, bro, but there's no food. There's no fresh water. He said, brother, I told you I tithe, which means in about one to two days, my pastor will find me. <laughs> Let me reiterate that uh, you're tithing off $100,000 every week. I'm gonna find you too. <laughs> but... Um, you know, I, again, I, I just want to break the ice on on giving because and, and money because again, uh, it is a sensitive topic. It's a, especially a sensitive topic when we're going through a, a pretty severe uh, or challenging financial moment and uh, crazy inflation, crazy stuff happening in the world. But I, I think it's it's kind of um, it's kind of like perfect for us. It's a perfect storm of just a disaster, and God going, "Hey, this is the moment." This is the moment because this is when I do my greatest miracles, when it's most impossible. Would you trust me in what looks like the worst time? And as I was worshiping, I just felt like God kept saying to me, uh, we do not live by sight. Faith is not by sight. Faith is, comes from, by hearing. And, and we hear the word of God and no matter what it looks like, we act in faith and it's then in which we see it with our own eyes. So anyway, uh, I want to preach a message today called The Art of Sacrifice. The Art of Sacrifice. Okay, and uh, I, um, I want to just kind of help you understand. Last week I talked about the grace to give. All of us are grace to give. Not all of us live in that grace. And, and really that's a fundamental Christian tenet, but so is sacrifice. Sacrifice is a fundamental uh, Christian tenet. It's foundational to Christian living. How do we know this? Well, remember I always tell you that, that God doesn't ask us to do things that he doesn't model. And, and, and when God saw that there was a sin problem, what he did is he took what was most valuable to him what was most important to him, and he made the ultimate and greatest sacrifice. He sends Jesus, and the Bible says, and I think you know it, for God so loved us, the world, that he did what? He gave. He he made a sacrifice. He gave Jesus to be crucified to cover our sin. Jesus is the great sacrifice. He is the pure spotless lamb that needed to be sacrificed, the shedding of his blood to cover our sin. But then he's the lion who roars, who rises from the dead, our king, our savior. But a lot of times we don't get to the roar moment until we go through the sacrifice moment. We we don't see the other side until we act in faith. And I want to go to Matthew 26, verse 6, and I think it's a great story of sacrifice. And the Bible says that meanwhile, Jesus was in Bethany at the home of Simon, 
who had previously had leprosy. Now, they're in Simon's house, and he was formerly a leper, but they still called him Simon the leper. Anybody do you like that? You made a change. You got skinny. They still call you husky. You know, I was balding uh, before I went bald. I made a change. They were calling me bald then. They're still calling me bald now. You know what I'm saying? People are messed up, man. Okay. I'm being funny, but you know, a lot of times we forget, and so do people, that we're a new creation in Christ Jesus. The old is gone. The new is here. God's put a new song in our mouth. He's covered and he's conquered our sin and he's thrown it as far as the east is to the west. And so when he says you're new, you're new, which means you may have lived a greedy life chasing things that you never got, but in Christ, you're living an upside down kingdom. That, 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 that the world is like, hey, what can I get? How can I gain? What moves can I make? The kingdom is what more can I release? And then God does the miraculous. Verse seven, while he was eating, a woman came in with an, a beautiful alabaster jar of expensive perfume and poured it over his head. Uh, this is that jar from the Jerusalem Museum. I went there this week and uh, flew spirit via the, the Holy Spirit, and uh, I'm sorry. And uh, anyway, so, so I, I've got this picture, <laughs> I'm sorry. I got this picture of this jar. Some, some might believe, or some even might consider that there was a breaking of the jar, and there was a pour, pouring, uh, there was an opening, whatever it was, uh, this jar Uh, The Bible says, and you see this in other translations, this jar full of oil could have been worth 40,000, 100,000. What what we know is that this jar with the oil was worth a year's wages. Imagine working all year long for the boss you hate. And I hope none of my staff members were cheering at that. All year long, and at the end of it, all the money that you, you gained, you're like, man, this was a price I paid working for that bozo. But I sense deep in me that there's one worth more. And so she makes the sacrifice. She pours it out. I, I just wonder if you worked all year long for somebody that you didn't like, not that she didn't like, but I'm just painting a picture wouldn't that be a sacrifice to you? That, that, that you worked and you labored and you gained. And then the last minute, you're like, here's everything that I gained. That would be a sacrifice. That would cost you something, wouldn't it? Yeah. See, see, the art of the sacrifice is this. A sacrifice, it must cost you. It has to, or it's not a sacrifice. What I love about this story and what I love about this woman is, is there's a lot of theories here. Some uh, believe th- this is Mary Magdalene and, and Mary Magdalene, what, what we understand is Mary Magdalene was, was, was messed up. Uh, she was full of, of demons and, and Jesus delivered her, healed her, saved her. Some, not all, there's a lot of study you got to do, but some even believe that maybe this was Mary, the same woman who is, who is washing Jesus' feet with her tears and wiping it with her hair. And uh, it, it's this powerful example of, of, of love. You know, it's really powerful because you have to understand that, that when you would walk in those days on dirty soil with rocks, your feet were cut up, you didn't have full shoes, you were dirty, and it would be customary when you would enter a home for your feet to be cleaned and, and, and for a servant to wash your feet. And what she was doing by displaying herself in that way, if that was truly her, was that she was serving her master in response. It was worship saying, thank you for delivering me. But if that was her, and whether it was her or not, it, it doesn't matter. But, but I just think, let's just picture for a moment that this is the same woman 
Now she's got this year's worth of wages and she's about to break it and pour it over his head. She's about to spend this. I think it's fascinating because what we see is elevated risk and elevated sacrifice. He delivers her and she does something that cost her from a reputation standpoint. She cries, she cleans his feet, but then she does something that cost her from a financial standpoint. See, a lot of times what happens to us is we are new into Christ. We're new in our journey with God and we're pretty radical. Oh, we're inviting everybody. We're telling everybody. Oh, we're weeping when we worship. But we've been hanging out with God for a while. We forgot about how good his grace was. We forgot about the, the depths of despair we were in. We forgot about the mess we were in, the debt we were in, the sin we were in, the struggle we were in. We forget quickly. And what I love about Mary is, is she wasn't quick to forget. In fact, when you're journeying with God for a while, I would say that your journey with God is really one in which you elevate your sacrifice. It's like, I've been walking with you for a while, God. I'm going to keep this fresh. I don't want to take grace for granted. I'm growing. I'm maturing. No longer am I drinking milk. No longer am I just sitting there and, and taking. No longer am I just sitting here and receiving. I'm giving back. And so she elevates her sacrifice and may that be the pattern of those who follow Jesus. That after a long while, we make a greater sacrifice. After a long while after that, when I'm 90, I'm still making sacrifices. Not comfortable and not getting comfortable with grace. I love King David, 2 Samuel 24, 24, but the king replies, no, I insist on buying it. For I will not present burnt offerings to the Lord my God that have cost me nothing. So David paid him 50 pieces of silver for the threshing floor and the oxen. So when you're famous or when you're in a high level of position or you're this athlete, um, this happens to me a lot when I go to restaurants. They say, your money's no good here. <laughs> I made that up. <laughs> but you know, people give free stuff a lot of times to, to people of importance. And, and, and what we see here is somebody really uh, basically offering the king this, this, this free threshold and oxen because he wants to make an altar and make a sacrifice to God. He wants to worship him. And David knows something. David knows something. He goes, I cannot, I, I will not make a sacrifice to God that costs me nothing. Here's the king of the earth, the most wealthy, popular person on the planet going, oh, but there's one greater. How could I ever, my worship must be a sacrifice. See, sacrifices got to cost you something or they're not sacrifices. You know that old song, we bring a sacrifice of praise into the house of the Lord. It's true. Do you bring a sacrifice of praise or do you show up 15 minutes late and miss all of worship? Jesus. I know you got kids. I do too. But like, honestly, like there's something about sacrifice that kind of puts us in a position to be more like Jesus and to worship him the way he deserves. When's the last time you made a great sacrifice. You know, there's been several times in my life and I, I try to tell some of these stories every couple of years and there's new ones that I'm experiencing. I told you some of that last week, but uh, there's a couple of stories that really stick out to me in my life. I remember I was, boy, I was maybe, I don't know, 21 years old, 22. And uh, there was a family in our church um, who was a part of the worship team and I really loved them. They, they would drive an hour away to come to church and serve. And I remember I was a, a very poor youth pastor. I was living in Dallas, Texas. And uh, I, was, I, was, uh, I was living in a, in a one bedroom, but I had like three dudes in there. We were just trying to make it. And uh, <laughs> you should see us, it was like a dorm room. And, uh, and, and I, I remember I was also trying to finish college. I was on my last semester. 
And I had been working and saving and, and, and different things. And uh, I remember one night I was out to eat with this, this family and I, I, all of a sudden out of nowhere, I felt the Lord drop in my heart. Hey, you know that money that you've been saving to pay your final semester of school? I said, no. <laughs> he said, well, whatever you don't know, I want you to give that, those thousands of dollars to this family anonymously. I said, I don't want to do that. That's not you. You would never ask me this. God, you know how much I hate school. <laughs> Took me seven years to graduate. Don't owe me, okay? I paid it in cash. That's what I was trying to do. And I took a lot of semesters off. And sometimes semesters took off for me as well. <laughs> And, uh, and, but anyway, I was like, so I wrestled with God for weeks. And finally, I just said, Ugh, fine. And, uh, and, and I remember one night, it was, I, I couldn't sleep, and I turned on this TV preacher, and I heard this word uh, about listening and being obedient and sacrifice, and I just knew it. And the next day, I got up, and I went to the bank, and I pulled out every single dollar, and I said, okay, God, I'm going to trust you in this. Well, it was that Wednesday night, the family showed up. I had somebody anonymously give them the money. That was that, didn't think of it. The next week I saw them and they said, pastor, did you hear what happened? I said, no. <laughs> You're allowed to fib in those scenarios, I think. I knight you to fib there only. And, uh, and, 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 um, and they said, well, last week we came to church in faith. We had no money. We had no gas. In fact, we didn't know how we were going to leave church because we were basically on E. My husband lost his job. We couldn't pay our mortgage. And somebody handed us cash. And it was to the penny everything we needed to get through that month. And I said, yeah, you can give God a praise for that. And for me, I was like, all right, God, that's cool. That's enough. Finish school sometime in my 40s. And, um, and I took a semester, that semester off again. And then, uh, and I got a call from a, a, a family member who, um, doesn't have any money and, and I didn't even know they knew God. And maybe at that time they barely did, but they said, Hey, you know, I, uh, God told me to, to pay for your last semester of school. I said, uh, you know, it's like thousands of dollars, right? I said, yep. Already wrote the check. It's on the way. And when I got the check, it was $1,000 more than I needed. What I'm saying is this, is God never asks us to make a sacrifice unless there's a reason behind it. He, he asks us to sacrifice because what he's doing in us is he's, he's helping, he's doing a few things. He wants us to trust him as our security he wants us to meet the needs of those we are sacrificing in a sense or for him, but through him. And then he also wants to show us that he's God. You can't outgive him. You can't out sacrifice him. And I'm glad I was obedient, obedient. And I'm telling you, there's never been a time in my life, never been a time in my life where I made a sacrifice, where I was obedient and I regretted it. Not one time. Verse eight, the disciples, the Bible says, were indignant when they saw this. They said, what a waste. It could have been sold for a high price and the money given to the poor. Do you really think they were thinking, we're going to give this to the poor? No, they were thinking, we are going to the local butcher shop after this because we've worked really hard and we're going to eat good. I don't know. I can't put that in our mind. All I know is this, is that when you make a sacrifice, it will invite critics and it will defy logic. I also want to say this because think about, think about this. Here's this woman who doesn't really have much status. She probably has a bad reputation. I mean, if they're still calling Simon the leper and he's been healed of leprosy, they're probably still calling her Mary the... I thought of a few words and then I stopped myself. You know, it's like, it's like but, but, but she makes this sacrifice. And here's what I want you to know. Not all Christians are spiritual. 
It's really important for us in our Christianity to also be spiritual. But here's the thing. No matter what, when you hear from God or when you make a sacrifice to God, no matter what, there's always going to be naysayers. You got to be careful who you tell. It's between you and God. Now, what I love about this story is honestly, we don't see God asking her to make a sacrifice. She just loved him so much that she needed to do it. And so because she does this irrational, radical, crazy thing, it brings critics because it doesn't fit within logic. How could you do this? Essentially what they were saying is, why did you waste this sacrifice on Jesus? You're, if I'm Jesus, man, uh, uh, these dumb fools who I'm walking around town, showing them everything, and they're saying, they're, they're basically saying, hey, you're not worthy of that. Yet, God loves them and loves us. Even when we say dumb things, do dumb things, think dumb things, he still takes us on a journey and says, follow me. But people who fear might be afraid for you if you make a big sacrifice. People who don't hear from God might have something to say. People who don't want you to advance in your journey, they might have something to say. Here's what I'm saying. You got to hear from God and you got to throw out logic. Because a sacrifice, it's got to cost you something. And please believe it will bring naysayers. Another time in my life, right as Lauren and I were about to get married, we were about 20 526 I was and um, there was this struggling youth pastor and his wife and I I really sensed in prayer I, I felt like God said hey you know that Jeep that you have your Jeep Grand Cherokee that doesn't have a lot of miles and that runs fine and that has leather seats and that has no dents or anything in it and it works and stuff and has new tires I want you to give that to that youth pastor um, uh as the first act of your marriage. I said, definitely not you, God. How might we get around to do kingdom work when this new woman I'm marrying has this broken down Toyota Corolla that doesn't work a lot? I said, that's my problem. Yours is to be obedient. So, I remember the day we got in our moving truck and left the car and everybody was like, Where, why, you, you gotta take your car. I said, no, God told me to leave it here. People didn't like that very much. When we went where we were going, we were there for about a year and, all, and, and it was right before we then moved to Philadelphia to plant the block church. And uh, I, 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 there, was a, there was a single father uh, who were, was raising five kids and that same prompting I sensed, hey, before you go to Philadelphia, I want you to sow the seed. I want you to give that Toyota Corolla that used to not work, but now works to him. Lord, how are we gonna get around in Philadelphia? Well, you're going to figure it out. Also, there's public. Also, that's my problem, not yours. It was in the midst of all this, donating these two cars, sowing these seeds into our marriage. We're going to have a generous marriage. Uh, but then sowing into Philadelphia, we got a phone call. Now, what I didn't tell you is my wife had been hampered by student debt, about $80,000. And that payment at the time before there was all sorts of consolidation and learning was about $850 and it was quick approaching. And I was like, I don't know what we're going to do and how are we going to start the church like this? And we got a phone call from a woman we didn't even really know well. And she said, God spoke to me. I'm supposed to pay Lauren's student loans for three years so you can establish the church. And every single month, we got a check in the mail for $850 and God was faithful. And what God reminded me was, is I ask, you do, I provide. That's how it works. Just be obedient. You, 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 friends, we, we cannot, we cannot out-sacrifice God. We cannot out-give God. Provision is his problem. Sacrifice is yours. 
And it's great math because it never adds up, but it always works out. Come on, somebody. Verse 10. But Jesus, aware of his knucklehead disciples, says, guys, why are we criticizing this woman for doing such a good thing to me? You always have the poor among you, but you will not always have me. And what Jesus was saying was, is a sacrifice will always have a window of opportunity. A window. Jesus is, is communicating that, that right now is the moment. I'm, I'm, I'm headed towards death and I've got to be anointed as king, but also I got to be anointed in burial because I'm going to raise from the dead. It was an act of faith, but it was also prophetic. And these guys don't understand. And Jesus is going, there's a window to sacrifice. And what I'm telling you today, friends, hear me, is there's a window for us to make this kind of sacrifice. A window. A window for us to say, okay, we hear you, God, because something is in front of us to not just buy buildings, but to make disciples in our short life. Our life is a vapor. It's here today. It's gone tomorrow. What kind of legacy will you leave? There's a window. And in verse 12, the Bible says, she pours the perfume on me to prepare my body for burial. And I tell you the truth. Listen, wherever the good news is preached through the world, this woman's deeds will be remembered and discussed. Here we are thousands of years later talking about this woman who had a bad reputation that did something great. Isn't that so good? And I keep saying this over and over. Please hear me, guys. Hear me, hear me, hear me. I keep saying this over and over again. The sacrifices that we make right now over the next couple years, they will reverberate for generations to come. We're not just buying buildings. We're taking kingdom soil. And every inch of kingdom soil is contested. It takes sacrifice. It takes labor. It takes hard work. But we're going to see the next generation transformed in these buildings. We're going to have mission teams in these buildings. We're going to transform addicted lives in these facilities. People are going to find salvation in these facilities. We're going to see people get healed, saved, delivered, transformed in these facilities. We're going to get kids off the streets in these facilities. We're going to host conferences. The nations are going to come to Philadelphia and say, I've been touched from God in these places all because we saw the window and we said, it's our time to build the house. It's our time to make a sacrifice. And as I close, I just want to uh, bring this commercial to you by Essential Oils and doTERRA. This is eucalyptus. And do I got any oil people in the house? What a, what a thing you guys got going. Listen, uh, here's what the oil people believe. They believe that one drop it will fill the atmosphere with glory. Your life is transformed if you take one whiff. The oil people believe this. They believe that this stuff has literally the body of Jesus in it. It heals you. Have you ever met an oil person? Come on, somebody. If they put oil on your back, your life is changed. Your body is healed. And honestly, there's something in there. <laughs> but they didn't have essential oil back then. They had the good stuff. They had the real stuff. They had the non-diluted stuff. Okay. But I was just thinking about this, right? I mean, this is powerful scent. And, and honestly, this stuff's expensive, right? I mean, it's, it's got a price to it. You, you don't want to pour out a lot of this. This will cost you. But as expensive and as nice and as glorious as essential oils are, what she brought to the table was more. And what, what she did is she has this, 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 this bottle, this alabaster jar that, that, is, that is worth a year's wages and she lived a tough life, but here she is with this money and it would have been probably good enough to do a drop and be like, cool, I love you, Jesus. That was a little generous. But the Bible says that Jesus is the anointed one. And what did you do when a king became a king? You poured oil on him. You anointed him. And so she understood something because she understood the Torah. She understood that 
I'm about to anoint my king of kings. And I only make this kind of sacrifice for a king. And so honestly, even if half of it, like half of it, it would have been like, wow, this lady was radical. But this wasn't just some king like David. This was the king of kings of the heavens and the earth. This was her savior. This was her deliverer. So she said, it's not a drop. It's not half. It's all. He has all of me. I, I give myself away. He saved me. He healed me. He delivered me. You can have all of me. Oh, it's not enough. I wish I had more to sacrifice. You can have my whole life. I pour it out. May the fragrance of the oil reflect the sacrifice of my life. Friends, this is a sacrifice. And you and me, we are that woman today. We're not better. Maybe our sin's better hidden. But man, if God's changed your life, don't, don't make a sacrifice that doesn't cost you anything. Empty it all. Empty it all. I want to get to the end of my life. Like Paul, where he says, I lived, I lived my life well. I, I was beaten. I was tortured. But man, I ran the race. I finished. He says, my life was poured out like an offering. This is our moment. Won't you let your life be poured out like an offering? And I, at every location, even at home, you can find this on our website, but I want every location to grab their commitment card that's on their seat. And would you hold it? And the worship teams at our locations are gonna sing a song. And while we do this, you can stand, you can kneel, you can sit. But what I want you to do is, is say, Jesus, what kind of sacrifice are you asking me to make? How is it gonna look for me when my bottle is emptied? So as we sing this, would you ask the Holy Spirit, speak to me, speak to me, speak to me for October 23rd. Father, right now in Jesus' name, speak to every heart. Convict, challenge, transform, renew. God, do a work right now. Speak to every person as we listen for your voice so we can say, I lived a life that was poured out. In Jesus' name, amen.